I want to take a look at uh, less on the technologies, more on the capabilities, and try to answer the question of who might be interested and why, what is the upside, and for who. Next slide, please. I run a think tank, the Institute for Global Futures. We do one thing mostly for uh, corporations around the world and governments to look at what are strategic readiness factors. How do we define that? What does that model look like? Uh, we look at a variety of different kinds of technologies. I'll break down five today, but focus on neurotechnology. And our mission really is to enhance future readiness. So I'm going to put together two concepts and then come back to this and reiterate it. Lack of imagination is the enemy of future readiness. And those of us who are involved in deterrence, strategic awareness, know the implications of that. Is it possible that neurotechnology could be a candidate for a new threat domain or contributed to a new threat domain for all intents and purposes that their only enemy might be a lack of imagination? Worldwide clients, a lot of them are in the room today. So I'd like to start out by uh, thanking Softworks for inviting me and just to suggest to you that I've been working uh, with the community in identifying a variety of technologies over a fairly long period of time and I'm still on this journey. Also, I'd like to just call out Dr. Giordano who gave me an opportunity to work with him at the Center for Neurotechnology at Potomac Institute where we started to do some of this work. So I'm going to frame out for you kind of the big picture of what neurotechnology looks like to give you, for those who are not that uh, aware of that, we've been focusing a bit more on the particular incident in Cuba and the analogous implications uh, for other attacks that might be have a signal, similar signature. But really what I'm going to do is try to paint a picture of where this technology has been, where we think it's going, and also then drill down on this particular event. So. Uh, this is a model that came out of some work that was uh, supported by the National Science Foundation, NSF, and it was work that was done over the past decade uh, to kind of consider what are the top technologies that are exponential technologies that are game changers, meaning for our civilization. That, that would affect everything from healthcare to defense to manufacturing, you know, what does it look like? And the top technologies we identified were uh, nanobio, IT, and neuro. And then subsequently, I upgraded this model and added quantum as another strategic technology that would create a massive amount of opportunities. Now, every one of these five technology buckets has dual use. So for all intents and purposes, we focus almost exclusively at NSF at, in our study on uh, uh, converging technologies for improving human performance, but we recognized also that there was a dark side. Dual use technology has followed us throughout. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But just to define that so we can move on, it's the manipulation of, of really genes, atoms, neurons, bits, and now qubits that will shape the next likely decades, if not 100 years plus, of our civilization. And there's other ones that you can fold into this. The one I'll be focusing on talking more about is neurotechnology. Convergence of exponential technologies, certainly the rise of neurotechnology has had a broad effect on many other areas other than just uh, medicine. And for all intents and purposes, the one area that, quite frankly, has not been affected has been in security and defense. For all intents and purposes, we've been looking at innovations. For instance, neural nets, which are at the core of artificial intelligence, control and monitor over a trillion dollars worth of financial trading, for instance. Neural modeling and technology has a massive impact on chip spaces. Uh, let me, can you take me back a couple of slides? I want, right there. I want to just make a point about this. The singular scientific piece of this that is published, that we published, is a thought that I did not convey, but I just want to suggest to you. It is not just that nanotechnology, the manipulation of matter at the atomic level, or, or, or the mapping of the hum human genome, or the ability to be able to create a new computing platform in, 
in quantum computing is important. It's how you think about these together, nanobio, IT, neuro, and quantum. And that's been the big aha in doing the scientific modeling work. Why? Because most of the time, and if you look at how we've organized these bodies of work, whether it's nanotechnology or neurotechnology or IT, is their silos. You've got folks that really get computers, quite frankly, who are working, even adapting innovations, never talk to neuroscientists. Neuro neuroscientists are not engaged with nanotechnologists who are a kind of an engineering measure. Biotechnologists who are working now, there, there's a few crossovers, like synthetic biology is the beginning of this convergence, but the idea we were suggesting is if we're gonna create and solve big problems that are facing our nation, whether they're sec national security, or whether healthcare in terms of disease, or manufacturing futures, what do we have to do? We gotta think more holistically about the systems approach to science, and here are the five key technologies. We could have chosen other ones, but these are the big strategic ones. So thinking about these together requires a different way of looking at science. And that implication is dramatic for where we are today with neurotechnology, but also it has to do with the breakthroughs that would need to occur in healthcare and security and certainly defense and other domains as well. So let me talk about the big context, therefore, okay? If you're traveling with me on this journey, right? I'm gonna to get to our, our focus. So I'm gonna now kind of pivot a little bit, focusing on the trends that are associated with neurotechnology, then go after this particular event and what the implications may be. So the first is that we're all living in, in, in Moore's Law. And most of the time you think about Moore's Law, again, as you know, this was the, one of the founders of Intel, basically he, his hypothesis was that computer technology was doubling in power originally in 18 months, we brought that down, it's actually collapsed, so it's less than 12 months. In that same period of time, Moore said that you know, the cost of that technology power was also being halved. So when I was at Apple Computer, we spent, it was $2,300 to bring out the first Macintosh, and you know, it's a little black and white screen, you know, and it, 30 megahertz, and you know, it was a box, and, Wow, what does $2,300 get you today? Supercomputer. Most of you are carrying them in your, in your backpack, right? Your, so we're talking now about, and no one's used this word before, neuro Moore's Law. And, and you heard Dr. Belbin talk about these devices. He's absolutely right. You know, this is not rocket science. We're not, this is all about Moore's Law. Shrinking, smaller, more powerful devices. So I'm not gonna prosecute the, hey, maybe this is some exotic technology, maybe it is, but maybe it actually is. Somebody hacked some pest control devices and they wove it together and then somebody else looked at that as an example and they put something else together, right? So, I mean, if you wanna to cut to the end, it might be, you know, what are the diagnostics and devices to be able to create ways to interdict and prevent this? All the science is great, but maybe they need to be devices that are stuck in every location that we want to stick them in there, and they do two things. One is they monitor and they sense, and we certainly, every sensor is a small computer, they sense the inaudible range, and they end up alerting through a cloud network, the security services, if there is an intrusion and insult uh, that's, that's being monitored and shows up on our grid, and the other is we actually interdict it. Now, that's the operational thing that, quite frankly, uh, wouldn't be hard to put together, and that's an operational deployment. But before we get there, I'm gonna look at some other issues as well. All right, so the other part of this neuro Moore's law is not only every device getting smaller, and more powerful, and cheaper to deploy, but it has to do with the proliferation of those five key technologies I talked about. So it's the proliferation of nanobio IT neuro. So you heard Dr. Giordano reference uh, nanoparticulates and nanotechnology. Again, the manipulation of matter at the atomic level. Just want to remind you the era that we live in, right? Anybody out there manipulating matter at the atomic level at home? Well, you could. You don't have to have a big lab, right? CRISPR is a technology for doing genetic engineering. You know what the skill set is? Operating a video game. You know, we're living in an era of accelerated proliferation of 30 or more technologies, which you don't have time to prosecute today, and the implications, obviously, for security and defense and intelligence are massive, as well as they are for healthcare, manufacturing, 
finance and the beat goes on. So that's the era that you're living in. Accelerated exponential technologies, I named five, and we'll be drilling down more on neuro. Now, there's also two parts of neurotechnology. I'm, I'm carving that out of neuroscience to say, okay, so here is something to pay attention to. And when it comes to neurotechnology for the applications that it looks like in Cuba, and we think in China against uh, officials, American officials, it's likely there are two dimensions to neurotechnology. One is a soft dimension, which is dysfunctionality, cognitive impairment, the inability to be able to make good decisions, right? Even dizziness and health effects, but certainly cognitive dysfunctionality as a delivery, as a weapon system. Think about that. And then there's, there's the, the hard dimension, soft and hard, of neurotechnology, which is com rendering individuals not just dysfunctional, but inoperable, or even dead. Fatality. All right? So we haven't gotten to that. But the issue of non-lethality of weaponized capabilities, non-lethal -lethal weapons, that are associated with neurotechnology, that is the era that we're in. So my operating assumptions to do this work are one, Americans were attacked, American officials were attacked. There was a signal sent by certain parties for a purpose, we'll get into that. And there's not a, the conclusion is, of course, well, why was that done? Was to demonstrate a proof of concept. We'll talk about the implications of that. And we'll get into who potentially the geopolitical actors might want to accomplish that. But you can follow that logic pattern forward to be able to run that out. This is an operational deployed capability. Soft, non-lethal. The possibilities in what we call hybrid conflicts are that there is now a new weapon, a neuro weapon, a neurotechnology weapon that is now available. We have to accept that as the new reality. And we particularly have to accept it for all intents and purposes because it's already been deployed. And it was targeted and pur purposeful. I don't believe that it was an accident because of the cohort that was targeted. And now that we have two instances that we can compare data on, we don't really need to see the data. We know that there's two populations that are similar. There are other friendlies that were targeted. So the assumption of accepting the deployment of a new weaponized capability is, let's get over it. Okay, we got that. Now the issues are deterrence, prevention, diagnostics. That's my operating premise. So neuro is likely a game changer, maybe. I wanna now drill down, just again, this is a larger context, but this is, there's a variety of things you don't think about that neurotechnology has an implication on, which I'm trying to point out is that it's, it's, it's a much larger phenomena in terms of impact domains where it's in the wild. And many of the same agents I've seen, and I, I mean neuro agents, these are, are in silico programmed bots are now programmed on the way we model neuronal interactions and dendrites. So again, this is just a, a bigger phenomenon of which this is one carve out, but it's not like there's not tremendous opportunities that are going on in other areas and the implications. And we haven't even talked about also enhanced minds and, and the performance enhancement from neuro and cognoceuticals, which is a whole other dimension to this, which we're not getting into today. There's direct implications, the other side of what we're talking about. Also, it's had a massive impact on healthcare. We don't have time to go after all this, but you know, if you look at the far side uh, on the right, it's neural enhancement as a deterrence for a prevention for age-related diseases. Again, every dual-use technology will have a dark side and, and, and a light side. We're in that era now, why? Because half of the population is at risk for Alzheimer's, the other half of the population will be caregivers, 
or dealing with a phenomenon, a global phenomenon, which comes from longevity and a variety of other factors, quite frankly, that we don't understand, but has to do with the aging of the brain and may have to do with insults to our civilization that we're creating, which is a whole other factor. But that's the era that we're in. There's 100 companies working to defeat aging, which have to do predominantly not so much with your bones, your organs, or even disease, which are, we're, we're navigating that, have to do with cognitive dysfunctionality, decline associated. So we're, we're in an era, you might say, where cognitive fitness is a capability that we will all need to understand better. And, the, and neurotechnology, therefore, is a deliverable in this era of cognitive fitness. One side is enhancement, longevity, health. The other side is weaponization. I want you to just put that out as a context so you understand for those of you who are unfamiliar, what it is. Uh, everything you ever hear about robotics, artificial intelligence, all of this is what? Converging with neurotechnology. You can't get there without that. We're building robot brains. What are they going to do? They're modeled after what? Nature. Bio nano mimetics. Parallel phenomena, right? Not many folks understand the convergence of these factors. Remember, five key technologies. All right, so neuronal self-assembly. Again, we're in an era where, you know, one of the factors of nanoscience, and I was, um, I was the first private sector advisor to the interagency working group on nanotechnology. So what we did at NSF was we create, helped create the world revolution in nanotechnology by first investing under uh, President Clinton and then under President Bush we basically funded the formation of an entirely new domain, nanotechnology. But really, it was to be able to say, nanotechnology should be at the table with these other key technologies. Why am I talking about this? Because when you start to talk about neuronal self-assembly and nanotechnology, you're talking about the ability to be able to create a tight new marketplace and understanding of science and drugs and other things. And the dark side of that, the dual side of that, which is weaponized capability. So that was a reference Dr. Giordano made earlier, which there is a whole other conversation we could brief on, which has to do with nano, bio, neuro. Neural reprogramming is likely the driver of our architect of, and the defeat of age-related diseases and remodulating skeletal and organ combinations and the ability to be able to revitalize and rejuvenate even your brain. And again, this is stuff that sounds science fiction. It's really not, and we're getting there a lot faster, and it'll likely be delivered as a device. Okay, so I would hypothesize that neurotech is going to be a contributing factor in driving uh, the next hybrid war, which has already started. And this is an era of, again, soft, non-lethal, moving towards something else. Think about the implications of a neurotechnology capability that could render for a decision-making command structure uh, dysfunctionality in terms of decision-making and just distort time. I want to distort time. I want people to lose track with time. And I want to affect that part of the brain that leaders have to do that. How would that affect a battalion? How would that affect a series of negotiators for a treaty? How would that affect people you might lose track of time and have a stress factor? Could I echolocate and deliver that signal? Could I, gentlemen? Yes. Possibilities are there. So we think about hybrid conflict as irregular forces, diplomacy, cyber attacks, economic warfare. What if this is a new contributing dimension to that? And we haven't thought about that. We're not there. And if anything, this is a wake up call to what? That capability set. You gotta think about it in terms of deterrence like that. You have to think about that differently. Why? Because we live in an era where most of our major threats have been because of the lack of imagination that it could happen. Why? Because we have most folks fighting who were in leadership fought the last war. That last war, by the way, was yesterday, not tomorrow, thinking about the last conflict. So my suggestion is we need to think more radically about these. Again, one of the other factors of Moore's Law is the, is the accelerated velocity 
of innovation. Well, <laughs> you're, you, you could just listen to this, right? You're going back and you're gonna, you're gonna brief the command that there's, listen, there's these pest control devices, you know, we think that created this, uh, you know, this attack, you know, I mean, it sounds, I, I really wanna do that brief in front of, you know, Joint Chiefs, don't you? To hear them, I hear the laugh. Yeah, and, and it's like hearing, you know, guys hijack planes. So I just want to point out, interestingly, uh, this is an example of a massive DOS attack in St. Louis over the past, you know, year, massive. Someone is testing a, a, a DDoS attack on the West Coast. This is what it looks like, right? This is what it looks like. Imagine that as a neurotechnology attack. And notice also that what a botnet is, the core of a botnet is self-propagating what? It's like a virus propagating in real time. At a, it's, a neuro, it's an activated silicon programmable neuronal agent. That's a lot of what it looks like. Because once it's set in motion, what does it do? It's like Ebola for networks. I'm just trying to disrupt your thinking, think along the lines of how these, it's a different way of paradigm of looking at this stuff. So as I said earlier, every technology has kind of this, you know, dual side. So fantastic futures are low cost designer drugs, stuff that, you know, is we go after being able to do proteomic targeting for cancer cells and living cells as biofoundries. We're getting all there. At the same time, we've got hypervirulent protoviruses, genetically selective pathogens, Trojan horse. Were you, same thing with neuro, just apply that. This is applied to bio, apply it to neuro. We need to be forecasting and imagining these kinds of models and possibilities because somebody's already shot across our brow. You know, this is a clinical trial in the wild and they've used the target to be American officials. Now we've got two instances. We don't know any other instances other like this based on, so you have to assume it's a purposeful targeted attack. Okay, we got the message. So let's talk about this, this is very interesting. Um, let me start with the data set in the middle, uh, which is what is apparently legal, that's what's legal in terms of conflicts. The notice, it's, it's psychological effects, psyop stuff, it's basically dysfunctionality, rendering, lack of capacity, acoustic weapon, weaponry, all right? This is about 10 years old, this slide. So it's, it's not like the stuff is new, it's, it's maybe being deployed in a new way, okay? I also wanna point out that the effects and the effectiveness, we have had a lot of data, you've heard from our eminent faculty of doctors that this is one, credible, two, here's what it looks like, and three, here's the science. So I'm not gonna go through all that, but I also wanna point out that this is a patent from 1999. I did, a, I did a scan as part of research with my team looking at patents. And you know, when you look at patents, it gives you a sense of intellectual property of what people were thinking about that they wanted to do. 1999, you've got a, an acoustic hydrodyne weapon, US patent 588, et cetera, March 30th. And it's, it gives you a sense of what are the possibilities to be able to, what the science may tell you, okay? So, also, this is, these are devices that are being carried around from various sources. Uh, this one is from Canada, backpack. That's Moore's Law, the oper operationalization of Moore's Law. But these are also devices that have been used for crowd control, larger populations, but they're, they're targeted uses that are portable. Slide, please. These are examples of deployments, real-time deployments. Again, am I saying they're exact for what we've seen in Cuba or in Asia? Uh, similar, but these are for crowds. You can, the circle is the devices that are mounted. Uh, some of them, I'm not gonna get into exactly what the actual 
technology is, but as you can see with the people, with their hands over their ears, you know, it's having an effect, okay? So it's not like this has not been fielded as well, okay? I wanna also say that, you know, <laughs> the neurohacking, which is maybe a term you haven't heard of, uh, the ability to be able to create bots, but also I mentioned that earlier, blend it with AI, but sensors and networks, we haven't talked about that, the ability to be able to deliver this. So these devices, which we think, that were used either externally to the habitats where the subjects were targeted, or it may be in, you know, internally, but we haven't talked about whether you know, there could be other kinds of uh, devices such as you know, flyables, drones, or they were tied to other sensors, or sensors were hacked. Where am I really going with this is that you know, in an era where everything is hackable, everything is hackable, health devices, routers, I bet you, you know, a large portion of the folks listening to this in their home, and we have some experts here who can attest to this, that most devices that are now networkable are what? Hackable. And neural hacking, we're just, you know, as we develop devices to adjust or refresh memories, which we will have at the nano scale, you don't even need them at the micro scale, uh, you're gonna end up, everything that can be made can be hacked. And it's, neural hacking is an area that we don't even have people really thinking about yet because we don't have all the devices, but that's where we're going. That's part of the story that we're learning today. Okay, slide please. So weaponized neuroagents, interestingly, this is kind of heading towards our bad guy actors here, you know, for all intents and purposes, in the era of nano neurobiology, synthetic biology, molecular delivery, you know, the ability to deliver these agents, it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. We've had two events of use of neurotoxins uh, that should show us. So one part of the continuum is, is kind of crude weapons, and they're clearly weapons, right? The neuroagent, the Russian neuroagent in, used in, in Europe uh, against targeted, so that was purposeful. Then we've had another example of the agent used to uh, uh, inflict insult and, and, and and mortality against in North Korea, in rather in, in Asia against North Korean uh, ex-resident. So, for all intents and purposes, you are now talking about that's the crude part of the neuro supply chain. This is a more sophisticated, non-lethal part of the neuro supply chain, neuro weapon only supply chain, right? But I would forecast there's going to be a lot more. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But it doesn't have to be as sophisticated as this. And this, again, we don't have time to prosecute this, but in the modeling work that we've done at Potomac Institute, or this conference on neurotech, neuro uh, war and the implications of neurotechnology for that, we modeled out a variety of things, uh, of which uh, we're, we, we've done about, since that time, which was, I think, 2014, uh, about half of these are now deliverable as capabilities. So the other part of this, as we make a transition now from talking about uh, really kind of an overview of technologies and drilling down on neurotechnology, I want to talk a little bit about then the other complementary side of this, the geo geopolitical implications, and of course, you know, who uh, might be a potential uh, interested in doing this. So this is, again, a body work that I had uh, developed when I was uh, advising um, SOCOM around bad guy hunting targeting, and I came with this concept of dark networks. Dark network is a criminal, terrorist, sometimes sovereign, who work together in a supply chain to be able to create and implement and plan and deliver. So in these global dark networks, which is kind of what has evolved, there are a variety of actors. Rogue states, radicals, non-states, uh, criminal, who are involved in a variety of parts of a supply chain that you need to be able to make stuff, deploy stuff, and produce disruption and conflict. 
You have to have banking, you've got to have logistics, you've got to have things to trade that are non-monetary. You need to have crypto. Where's our crypto friend? There he is. Call out to the crypto world. Cryptocurrencies, you've got to have the ability to be able to have other monetary forms to support your operation that are non-transferable, tra discoverable. You need to have a complete supply chain. Think about it like, you know, Walmart has a supply chain, right? They grow stuff and make stuff all over the world and they figure out where to ship it to, to assemble for the best taxes and which monetary unit to use where, to deliver to what markets or where. It's a supply chain. So dark networks have supply chains. Criminal and terrorists and sovereigns, bad actors have supply chains. So if you're in the bad, if you're in the bad guy hunting business, right? You gotta understand the supply chain. Follow the money, follow the logistics, follow the customers, follow the producers. So when we start to then apply that thinking to, you know, who are potential bad actors that would do this and why? You have an interesting model. So I built a model around that that we've used before. But you know, you start to also look at what does the literature indicate regarding who might be interested. The Russian view of modern warfare is based on the idea that the main battle space is the mind. Well, interestingly, remember I said earlier about the, the supply chain around neurotechnology, you've got on one end blunt tools, right? Use neurotoxins to take out parties. You've got subtler tools, which are information warfare, right? And now we've got more aggressive stuff, penetration of elections, fake news, fake identities, and all that. And then you've got these even subtler kind of non-attributable phenomena, which is these incursions in Asia and Cuba. It's part of the same thing. You might add to that also, you know, Syria and other folks that are using neuroagents. So again, you want to start thinking about these as supply chains, ecosystems of involvement. So let's take a look at, this is the bad guy hunting threat analysis. And I, I am working with a couple of other folks in this space. One is sensing about bad guy hunting. But let me give you a kind of a, I'm not going to go through all these, but let me give you kind of a list and then I'll prosecute a couple of them. So the, bad, the threat analysis goes, it, it basically cuts around, you know, who, what, where, how, and why. Not hard to figure out, right? That's what we're looking at. Identity analysis is, you know, what is this? Is it an agent? Is it a device? I think, again, I'm not going to go back into what our distinguished doctors had outlined for us because I'm in complete concurrence. I think it's important as a takeaway is this is not, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, an accident or some happenstance. This is a directed, purposeful target at a population that are American officials, and I understand there may be other officials from other friendly nations, but for all intents and purposes, this is a capability analysis that's been deployed, targeted, chosen, okay. So the second is kind of benefits, wins and losers. Who benefits from this? Who benefits? Well, the first order of benefits are the folks that are perpetrating this. What are they doing? Demonstrating capability set. Why would that be useful? Who would benefit from that? It's useful to be able to determine what the impact is, and then did the impact confirm what our objectives of that was? I said earlier, this is a clinical trial in the wild on humans. The second order of that is against whom? Well, the whom is Americans. That's very valuable to who? Well, that's a short list of people that would sponsor that, and maybe they didn't sponsor it, but maybe it's bad actors, rogues, that are basically advertising. We'll get into that a little bit more. I talked earlier about vendor supply chain, so I don't want to go into that, but I would say the vendor part of that is very interesting. I bet you today I can find similar pest control devices in Baghdad over the internet. I ran an, uh, an operation where I was putting together, I, I needed a, a drone delivery. I, Picked up the internet, found four or five places throughout uh, Baghdad, Iraq, Afghanistan, Paris, Marseille, and to put together an order. Nobody ever asked me why I wanted it. Could I find pest control devices and a variety of other technology that are clearly available and I can ship them from FedEx, 
maybe even buy them on Amazon or Circuit City and have them delivered, not Circuit City anymore, but Best Buy, yeah. So vendor and supply chain is very interesting. Ideologic for-profit research, likely all of them. Probably the least is ideologic. So you know, you think about things as ecosystems of interacting and related folks. We get don't be don't be fooled by ideology. Uh, Eighty percent of the bad guys are doing it for some kind of profit. They're in the game. I mean, the fuel that drives ISIS is the oil. There, it's a commercial enterprise. The Taliban. Uh, also, number six is interesting, geopolitical signaling and, and, and payback. What has occurred recently in terms of, you know, what's the short list of trade sanctions that are currently been deployed against who? It's a short list. Look at the list. Is there a geopolitical payback of which this event might be related to? Or what are the implications of that? It's a short list. Four major countries, not hard to figure out. Rogue, sovereign, dark network, we like to, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, you know, is it this or is it that? Is it? Maybe it's all of it. Maybe it's a carve out that doesn't know and they're playing. So at the end of the day, likely this event is a contractor looking for business and wants to prove up a capability and you got to think, well, wait a minute, Cuba, kind of get that, a backwater, we don't really have an embassy per se, you know, in China, given the treaties that are associated with this and the target of the population, wait a minute. So that, in some ways, who does that eliminate? Probably eliminates China. And, and probably then you start to ask yourself, who would benefit from... China being embarrassed with this insult occurring where they're responsible based on the treaties against Americans. That's a shorter list. Or it could get more complicated because you've got what I call, we'll get to this, a fractured sovereign scenario. Okay, I don't want to go into all of this. Um, it's like, if you look at the incursion in in, in India, uh, back in the day in Mumbai, that was an advertising for another, for a capability that was deployed someplace else in the world. So that you gotta think geopolitical in terms of, you know, what are the largest cities? What are those supply chains look like? And don't look at me over here, I'm gonna try something over here, but I'm really interested in showing this capability for something else. Think about it like the, the uh, history of comparable events for analogous deployments like cyber. Could Neuro end up looking like cyber? And the answer is yes, it's a, it's a proven up model. In fact, a product line extension from cyber would be Neuro. Why not? Hey, we've done great with cyber in terms of our profit center, and now we've got a new capability. Who wants to sign up? Prove up the capability. The commercialization of weaponized technology is a key driver, more so than ideological. Um, here are just the possible scenarios and then I'll, I will move forward. Um, fragmented sovereign is, you know, most countries have a variety of, you know, warring factions that have different perspectives, ideologic, political, economic, and for various reasons. Uh, the, these competing forces in regions and nations produce what we call fragmented sovereign. And fragmented sovereign scenario says your bad guys uh, basically have implemented this, that we're talking about this new intrusion because what? Because they're trying to accomplish something else. You gotta think three steps ahead. Well, they do this to be able to engage this to get people busy over there when they're really interested in something over here. Fragmented sovereign. Second is terrorist clinical trial. These are pretty self-explanatory. Likely, I like, I would bet on this as rogue actor practice. And that this is a 
a, a messy clinical trial because they get to do what? They get to have the Americans who have the best research to go ahead and do, analyze it, bring in the best doctors, and then do what? Open democracy, publish all the data, publish it all, do all our work for us. Thank you very much. Now we know, and what's better than the Americans to be able to analyze this? Because I can't find any Chinese reports. I have seen no Chinese data, very few Chinese reports, no pest control, you know, Chinese denials. So this is somebody that understands. Now I'll get. I'll give you the profile, right? This is a private sector bad actor who understands what he understands social media and information warfare. Clearly wants to advertise his capability. Wants to embarrass the Chinese, or at least put them in play, and is attacking a select group of State Department officials that have functions in two nations. Now, who's on that list? That's a short list. That's a short list. Do the math on that. Um, and then a dark network show of force, criminal terrorist organization that, again, they'd only do that, I think, because of a commercial interest. Sorry, slide please. So let me just say, uh, let me make a forecast and look forward. So you have to assume that we're at the beginning of, uh, a, of neurotechnology being now incorporated into this kind of hybrid conflict era, number one. Two, you should recognize, and, and, and I, I would suggest that we are looking potentially at additional instances. Why? Because this has been so effective. Americans played their part. Coast country played their part. A lot of good data. We're getting more data. Aren't we, aren't we getting more data? That's great. Cuba, China, we got more data. What's the next target? We don't know. It's likely it's not going away because it's been an effective trial. But it now is revealing as a deployment. And of course, the insult is that it's not, we're not talking about rocket science. We're not deploying, you know, some laser quantum fusion cannon. You know, this is not like super sophisticated technology which makes it even more interesting. So you're likely looking at, as I said earlier, the two parts of neurotechnology, the soft part for all intents and purposes is, hey, you know, you're talking about cognitive dysfunction, you'd be able to deliver, a deliverable as cognitive dysfunction to impact what? Decision making, operations, negotiation, communications. That's a big deal. The hard part is I'm less interested in. I, I don't think the design of this weapon is to kill or maim. I think it's to take parties out. And likely these are these State Department officials are not folks that are going to be able to go back in the game. So you got to think about that as a kind of a long-term impact and risk factor of which there could be additional locations. Is it possible we could be looking at super drones that could deliver this in terms of capabilities. Yeah, well, we haven't looked at it, but yeah, that's a deliverable. It's episodic, it's acute, it's here, it's gone. You can deliver from various levels. There are questions about the ability to be able to deliver echolocation and these other targeted things from 35,000 feet or 5,000 feet, and we don't know the answer to that. But there are devices that give us capabilities. And again, shrinking stuff down. So in summary, let me just say to you, one, Neurotechnology is here, it's not going anyplace. It will likely shape the competitive advantage of nations, organizations, and individuals. And that's for both good, bad, and ugly. So let's get on with it. Two. Second is that the attacks in China and Cuba appear to be purposeful and directed at a population that, by the way, could be expanded. And three, uh, the target U.S. officials is revealing in itself. And there have been no other instances similar to this, similar pathology, similar any place else that we're aware of. So I think somebody is sending a clear geopolitical message. It is a bad actor, whether they're in alignment with other sovereigns and that. So who would gain from this? These sovereigns, again, is a short list, but it's clearly signaling, a geopolitical signal. There is a communication going on. 
a new neurokinetic weapon would be disruptive in an era of hybrid conflict. And we have to assume that we are in a new era. And that new era purports that we have to have a way to deter, prevent, and detect. Thank you.